time, I don't know. Um, good morning, my name is John McHenry, and it is my great joy and privilege to be the pastor here at Aldi. Um, welcome to all of you in person, as well as to those of you watching on the live stream or tuning in later in the week. It's a great joy to have you in worship this week. We are finishing up um, our sermon series on prayer using the model with the acronym PRAY. Praise, repent, ask, and yield. And I want to thank Gwen Hess for bringing a message last week um, on ask and talking about some of the barriers that we face as we approach this holy God sometimes with things that we really wrestle with, with cancer, um, sometimes with God, would you please let this light stay green for me to get through it this time? <laughs> um, as, as trivial and as small as those little things are and as big and grand as those things are, we come and ask. Um, and I really appreciated the way that she drew the parallels from Jesus' teaching in the Lord's Prayer to the teaching she had handed down from her great-grandma in Kentucky in an accent that I'm not going to try to do. Um, I, I lived in Atlanta for 10 years, but I'm still, there's enough New Hampshire in me that I'm not going to pull that accent off today. So as we turn to yield, um, I, I mentioned a couple weeks ago and three weeks ago and two weeks ago, this isn't a set of rules. We don't have to praise, okay, I've checked that box. We don't have to then repent, okay, I've checked that box. We don't have to yield and then check that box and ask. We don't have to do it every time we sit down and pray or stand as we're walking our dogs and pray. We don't have to do it in that order, although I did talk about how praise makes sense to come first. Because praise, as we approach this holy God, gives us the sense of what we are undertaking as we talk to him, but also encourages us because we know the forgiveness that we have in him. We can repent because we appreciate that this is not just a holy God who sees our sin, but also a loving God. And then we might return right back into praise and thank him and just revel in this holy God forgiving us. And then we go on to ask oftentimes, and sometimes the pitfall that we fall into is one, we're afraid to ask, or two, and probably more often, we just have sort of a grocery list. Um, I need this out of aisle two, and I need this out of aisle five, and gosh, why did Harris Teeter turn this around? I don't know where the bread is anymore. And we're sort of picking our way through like we're shopping. And one of the reasons I like this model of praise, repent, ask, and yield is I like yield to be broken out. I like this model as sort of a diagnostic because what... I can fall into, what any of us can fall into, is by the time we've praised and repented if we've done that and asked if we've done that, before we get to yield, we might run out of time or run out of attention. The dog's barking and he's scratching at the door and you're like, ah, okay, I got to go do that. And we, okay, God, thanks. Good talk. Love you. Talk to you later. And God, figuratively speaking, is sitting there going, I didn't get to say anything to you. And if you've ever been told or told someone else, you're talking at me, not with me, you get a sense of what that's like. Yielding is often the point in our prayer lives where we might actually sit and listen and see what God is saying to us, even as we are offering ourselves. So we've looked at Psalm 40, um, not just there because Tamara is a huge U2 fan. Um, we looked at Isaiah 6, and you can see in Isaiah 6, which is one of my absolute favorite passages of Scripture, you see why I say that these are all important, but also that it's not just a strict set of rules, because Isaiah has praise as the glory just fills him in the temple. He repents because he's struck by God's glory, and he realizes how low he is. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. He doesn't spend a whole lot of time on ask, right? We don't see that at all in this passage, but he goes to yield. We don't have to do them all at the same time, but we should include all four of these elements in our prayer life over the course of a day or a week or a season. So I want to share one more, one more instance here. Um, 
And this is really the great yielding. Um, this is Jesus in the garden at Gethsemane, the night before he's going to be crucified, um, sort of at the base of the Mount of Olives. Um, Gethsemane, this is one of the weird things that you learn as you're studying over the course of a week. Gethsemane means oil press. So this presumably where they would have taken some of the olives down and pressed out into olive oil at the base of the mountain. Um, this is in uh, three of the Gospels. It's in Matthew, it's in Mark, it's in Luke. Uh, but I want to share this from, uh, from Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 46. Please listen for the word of God. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and he prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because her eyes were heavy. So he left them and he went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go, here comes my betrayer. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious, loving, sacrificing Lord Jesus. We acknowledge that we do not always yield to your will. We do not always say, here I am. We pray that by your word and by your spirit, we would come closer to following your example, to seek your will and to follow your path. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. So three, three examples of yielding in the scripture today. Um, first, we have David. And I love the Psalms. I read through them, pray through them often. Um, one of my favorite devotional practices is to read five psalms every day and then figure out which one sort of speaks to me and pray through that a little bit. Um, but you don't see a ton of yielding in that. But in Psalm 40, we hear David saying, here I am, it has been written about me in the scroll. And he acknowledges that God doesn't want the sacrifices. He doesn't want the, the burnt sacrifice, the burnt offering or the thank offering. He wants David. He wants David's heart and his service. And David here says, here I am. I seek to do your will. And in Isaiah, as I said, one of my favorite texts, just the awesome glory and power, Isaiah being struck by his own failability and his natural response is, here am I, here am I. I wonder sometimes if Isaiah had wished he asked a few more questions um, before he said, here am I. Isaiah, if you've read through the whole book, I think it's in chapter 20, it's a very short chapter, but it talks about Isaiah as part of his service to God is naked and barefoot walking through Jerusalem for three years probably not what he thought he was signing up for. And yet here's Isaiah faithfully following God and bringing a message first of warning and then of grace 
to God's people on his behalf. And then we have, in this scripture, Jesus in the ultimate yielding, knowing what's going to happen, knowing that he is going to be separated from the Father and from the Spirit, saying, I don't want to do this. I love that this records him saying, Abba, which is Aramaic and basically means daddy, dada. Daddy, I don't want to do this, but thy will be done. Um, for those of you who are parents, um, especially those of you who are parents of teenagers, you know when your kid doesn't want to do something and they do it for you, that's a huge deal. <laughs> and here Jesus is like, I really don't want to do this. He knows what's happening. He knows that all of humanity's sin is coming down, crashing on his head, and he says, I don't want to do it, but I will. But I will. We see Jesus' model yielding in the Lord's Prayer a couple times as well. Um, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. His will, not ours. And he models us to say that. And then at the end, when he points out, <laughs> for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Not for me is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, but for God is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever that we're not doing it for us, we're doing it for God. So we've got lots of examples of yielding that show us that this is something important, that show us that this is something that we ought to be considering in our prayer lives. Now, one of the questions we do well to ask that I alluded to with Isaiah, we often want to know what we are yielding to. God, I, you know, I think I'm on board, but just tell me what I'm doing. Tell me where this is going, and then I'll be on board. Ah, maybe, maybe, I wonder. Um, we often, and I hear friends of mine say, you know, essentially, I just want a burning bush moment. I just want God to tell me where I'm going. Do we really want a burning bush moment? I, you think about some of the burning bush moments we see in the Bible, Moses, in the literal burning bush moment, God basically says, come here, I gotta, t I gotta tell you something. And Moses walks over to check out this amazing bush that's not being consumed by the fire. And he says, hey, I need you to go to Pharaoh. Go to Pharaoh? Are you kidding me? He's gonna kill me. That's not a good idea. And he says, no, this is what I need you to do. And he says, well, you know I don't speak good. And God says, I'll give you the words. Come on, let's go. Um, Oftentimes with those burning bush moments, we get sent somewhere that we don't think we wanted to go. Isaiah effectively has a burning bush moment. And he says, here am I. And God says, okay, you're going to go tell these people <laughs> until they're sick of hearing it, that they need to change their ways. Sometimes it's a little easier for us if we yield ourselves and say, I will go where you want me to go, God, and then listen step by step. Because if we just get told we're going here, all the way over there, it's pretty far. I, don't, I can't do that. God often doesn't lead us by the burning bush, but by what I've referred to as more of a GPS. Um, my kid, I like, I admit, I'm old enough that I like to get out a map, a Rand McNally map, and look at it and say, okay, I'm going to take 15 to 17 to 95, and then I'm going to take 95 all the way down to, um, to Daytona Beach, and then I'm going to take four over to Orlando. And my girls are like, why are you doing that? The GPS will tell you every step you want to do. And I'm like, well, let me just go put it in MapQuest, and they'd laugh at me. Um, but as I went before... Um, the district committee on ministry and they said well where do you see this going i have oftentimes told them i'm not totally sure i'm just trying to follow every direction that this gps is giving me when god has said okay i need you to take this right turn taking the right turn and trying to be faithful to that 
And then if he says, keep going straight for five miles, that's great, we're going straight for five miles. If he says, take a left here, hmm, are you sure this is the left-hand turn we're supposed to take, God? You know I don't really like left-hand turns. I'd much rather go to the right. But being patient and just being faithful in every step, and part of that is as we yield in our prayer life. Yielding doesn't come natural to many of us. In this society where we can choose the social media we want, the TV shows that we want, we can choose oftentimes the careers that we want, we're used to getting what we want instead of saying, I'll do what you want, God. The closest thing I've had to the burning bush moment was, and I've mentioned this before, um, driving to work one morning um, as the presidential candidate that we were working for, his campaign was sort of falling apart. And I'm listening to you two as is often the case, and the words come through my speakers, you don't know, you don't get it, do you? You don't know how beautiful you are. And it was like the Holy Spirit just sort of smacked me and got my attention. And I just was really like, okay, I'm listening now. And the words of the song faded away, and I could hear the Spirit saying, sharing that message is what you need to be about. Letting people know that God loves them so much he gave his son for them. And that that is the most important thing about them. If they accept that sacrifice that he made for them, that's the most important thing that they can do. To know that they are that truly loved and to accept it. Now, that burning bush, or sort of flaming leaf is more like it, didn't say, and oh, by the way, five years from now, you're going to be preaching in the sanctuary at Aldi. It was just start preparing yourself a little bit because I am going to do something with you and through you. Um, I thought it would be more focused at Arcola leading the men's ministry, and then it was like, okay, that's good, you're doing that, but we're going to go a little bit further, and you're going to seek this licensing process to be a licensed local pastor. Okay, and then it was, and oh, by the way, you're going to be at Aldi. It wasn't all at once. It wasn't, boom, this is where you're going. Because initially, if I had heard, hey, turn off you two, you're going to Aldi, I, how are we getting there? What are, you, what are you talking about? We have to train ourselves through yielding to say yes first and then listen. Say yes first and then listen. So how do we develop that in our prayer lives? A um, couple, couple different things. One is honestly, literally, the words that David says here, here I am, the words that Isaiah says, here am I. The words that Jesus says, not my will but yours be done. Actually include those words in your prayer life. Include those words. Use scripture. Find those places in scripture where there's a yielding and use those words. Secondly, is to spend some time listening. I talked about God sort of sitting there going, where are you going? I haven't told you anything yet. What do you mean you're going off to meet with your friends at Panera? I, I didn't get to tell you anything about what I want out of you. Listen. Um... That is often the hardest thing in our prayer life, to sit and be patient and watchful and alert and not fall asleep, but to listen. Um, and that might be actually you're done praying, you've read the Bible, whatever your practice is in the morning or in the evening, and sitting and listening. It might be, as is often the case for me, walking the dogs afterwards, because at some point they absolutely positively want to be walked. And that's a good time to just be out in nature and be amazed by God's glory and listen a little while. Even then, I still kind of want to talk, um, but listen for a little while. Third, um, start with some devotionals. Um, three possibilities here. Um, one is the upper room disciplines. What I like about this is that it uses the lectionary to sort of guide us into some questions that might lead us into yielding. Um, it's usually very brief. It's a brief
brief scripture to read. It's a one-pager, and then it'll have some questions or a prayer at the end that you kind of have to think through yielding a little bit. Um, so that's one, disciplines. Um, this day is very similar. This is set up on a 30-day cycle um, where there are certain prayers, and this one is really, if you feel like yielding needs to be more a part of your prayer life, um, this one has some good questions on yielding in. Um, and then this is... Uh, a guide to prayer for all who seek God it follows the lectionary, um, but also has a variety of devotionals to look at during the week, even shorter than what's in disciplines, but forces you to think through what God might be telling you in the scripture and where he might be leading you. So those different options. Um, one, use the scripture and pray through that. Two, do some listening. Three, um, some of these devotionals, but one more devotional I want to ask you um, to consider and be part of. Um, I posted on Facebook. I think I did it right. Bill knows better than I do probably, um, but probably five minutes ago it would have hit um, on Facebook if I posted it correctly for 1045. Um, a devotional online, it's through uh, the U version, either the Bible app or the website. It's just bible.com. Bill says it's there, so we're good. Um, if you want to do it, you click the link. It's a seven-day devotional where you go on, you read the scripture, you, or you read a devotional, you read a couple scripture, and then there's an opportunity to just comment. And just, what is the scripture saying to you? And if you have something that the scripture is saying to you, you type that in and just hit send, and everybody in the group gets to see it. Um, this one is on Dangerous Prayers. It's by uh, Craig Rochelle who um, is a pastor of Life Church. His church actually developed the uh, Uversion app and the website. Um, that's just a great app to have scripture in your pocket on your smartphone, um, just as you're sitting in the doctor's office to not obsessively check to see if the Red Sox won last night and the Yankees lost, but to have something else on your cell phone to do, um, to get some of God's word into you on a daily basis. Um, but I would invite you to look at that link, sign up for it, um, and it's going to start tomorrow, and we'll just do it for seven days, and I look forward to seeing how and where that leads all of us. Um, good start for us to start thinking about um, rebuilding some Bible study habits as well um, as a group. I always ask you to join me in a word of prayer um, at the end of a sermon, and we are going to do it a little bit differently today. Um, if you would open your hymnal um, to page 607, um, this is sort of a tradition in the Methodist Church that we do on New Year's um, where we will go through and we will pray this and basically say, God, as we head into a new year, as we've got a clean slate, um, I want to do your will. Um, that's nice that we do it traditionally on New Year's Day, but every day as a Christian is a new day. Every day is a day that we remind ourselves that we are forgiven for our sins through Jesus' sacrifice and that we are available to serve him. So rather than me reading the light print and you just responding with the one bold print word here, uh, I would like us all to do this together as our closing prayer for the sermon. I am no longer my own but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee exalted for thee or brought low for thee let me be full let me be empty let me have all things let me have nothing i freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal and now o glorious and blessed god father son and holy spirit thou art mine and i am thine so be it and the covenant which i have made on earth let it be ratified in heaven. Amen.